the NHL. Some of the stuff that they've been caught with, ecstasy pills and all that other stuff outside the game and, and some of the other stuff that you've heard. Yeah, there is domestic violence. Nowhere close to what the NFL is producing. This is a problem. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be fixed overnight. It hasn't. Does anybody remember who Aaron Hernandez is? Aaron Hernandez killed three innocent people, one that he was accused of. Now, brain trauma has been a big problem in the NFL. It's been a huge problem in the NFL. Now, I'm not saying every single one of these players, Jabril Peppers, has brain trauma, but who knows? They need to figure out what is right for this league, how this league is going to be able to figure out when these players are doing it during the regular season, how to suspend these guys for putting their hands on a woman, putting their hands on a kid, or doing something of that magnitude, which will make the league look bad. Every time you hear a domestic violent thing, violence thing in sports, you, you know it's the NFL. You know it is. And that's a problem when everybody's pointing their fingers at the NFL. I, I, I don't understand this. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I don't care how great of a player he is. I don't care how good he produces on the football field. If he's doing something wrong and he's putting his hands on innocent women, and I don't care what the woman did to him, she's innocent. A man is 60 times stronger than a woman. He should not be putting his hands on a woman. He should not. It is a problem. And the NFL needs to figure this out now before somebody gets killed. They needed to figure it out for 10 years, really. Because... No, and now, before somebody gets killed, because oh, it's yeah. going to get worse. Yeah, it is. And it still is a problem that the NFL has dealt with when it comes to hypocrisy. Like, baseball, you mentioned, like, their domestic violence cases, there's still a good amount of them. But they handle it by suspending these guys the whole year, pretty much. Like, 80 games, I think, was, like, what Herman got, which was the rest of that year. Jose Reyes, when he got suspended in his, his second tenure with the Mets, they cut him right away. He was spending the rest of that season. Jury's familia, same kind of thing. Two to one, by the way. And I think the Yankees need to pull Clark Schmidt. I, I think it's done. Yeah. I think he's done enough. He's done good for five innings. Take him out. They're they're putting themselves in harm way, harm's way again. Yeah, another uh, hard hit ball as well. So three of the fourth inning, then then more in the fifth inning. But going back to what I was saying with the domestic violence of baseball, like they actually know how to discipline it, and that's why you don't see as many cases of that kind of thing that at least they're known of. And I mean, I mean, there's some in their other countries, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, stuff like that. We've seen issues of of those players having those kinds of just the way their culture is. And they're going to keep them in again. They're going to keep them in. Aaron, this is Aaron so Boone. stupid. This is dumb. This is this is the only thing that I attack Aaron Boone on is is he knows that. It's time to take the kid out, and he keeps him in too long. They're going to score. They're going to tie the game, and this inning's going to keep on going. They might even take the lead. He might even hit a home run here and 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 really put the Yankees in a bad position. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say the NFL is the, op is the opposite case where they're very – I don't know if they want to call it selective as much as it is like hypocritical in terms of like there's no consistency with it. Ray Rice got suspended for the entire year. Adrian Peterson got suspended for the entire year. Then Kareem Hunt only gets suspended for, I think, four games or something like that that season. Now the Chiefs got him. They – the Browns signed him in free agency later that year, but the standard is trying to be created by the league, not necessarily by the teams. And now you're seeing it with like, you were talking about Rasheed Rice. Rasheed Rice had two separate instances, repeat offender, and they do nothing. They just keep investigating it. This commissioner exemplus is created to suspend guys until we know a conclusion of an investigation. There's going to be another hearing November 22nd, like you were saying, suspend him until then if there's a ruling that he did he didn't do as as bad as he thinks i don't think he did i think he's definitely guilty of that but if there isn't then you can let him play again it's really not that hard but yet the nfl likes jumping oh this guy spent it four this guy suspended six he was found with cocaine he should be suspended for the season agree okay it, it doesn't matter if it was true or not true there has to be some kind of truth what he's going to do is he's going to do what his girlfriend is when he does have that november 22nd review uh, his girlfriend's going to say that he never put his hands on him and it's going to be waved off. I, and that's what usually happens. They get off of it because they pay off their girlfriend or pay off their fiance. This is what happens. Greg Hardy did it too. I don't trust that for the situation. Up oh, there's another and one. And there's the tie game. I just, I, I, again, Aaron Boone is just terrible managing. Terrible managing. RBI triple ties it up. It, it just doesn't make sense why you leave him in there after he's getting hit. What are you trying to get him to win? 
Are you trying to now get we'll him the five innings to now get we'll him the win? Now, now he's going to pull him out. Now, right. now we will. Fish, I don't even think a lot of these other managers care about that. I think uh, Cleveland pulled by D at four and two thirds in game one. Like, now right. we'll pull him out and then they'll bring in a relief pitcher where a relief pitcher is cold and somebody's going to get a hit and they're going to take the lead. This is what happens to the Yankees. It's just terrible managing. It's terrible. I, I knew it as soon as I pull him out. There he goes. He's going to take him out. Just terrible managing. That is. That is Aaron Boone's fault. If the Yankees lose this game, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from me, Aaron Boone's fault. That was Aaron Boone's fault. I can tell you right now, he doesn't have it anymore. Pull him out of the damn game. I don't know. I will, I'm sure we'll talk about this as the game goes on, I'm sure. But just to talk about Peppers for a little bit, I, I was coaching in North Jersey when he was there uh, in the Catholic schools. He started at Don Bosco and when, went to Paramus Catholic, a, a rival, and like jumped ship in the middle of his high school career. And it was a big deal back then. Everyone knew he was an elite talent, obviously uh, get that was going to be in the NFL or top D one type of kid. He was one of the top kids coming out of high school that year, but there are always stories about him with the partying and the steroids and the things like that. And then when he was on the giants, I thought, yo, look at this guy. Maybe he turned it around. He's home. He's, he's going to make good coming home. And it turns out he's still kind of the same guy. I mean, listen, we didn't know any of the stories about the women or anything like that, but I, and I don't want to touch on it. But look, there's been there's a lot of smoke around this guy his whole life. Uh, so and this doesn't surprise me. And, and look, I think it's the Greg Hardy rule, uh, Errol. I think that's why this commissioner's exempt list exists, so that guys like Jerry Jones can't just put that guy back on the field so he can get a couple of sacks and give him the money because uh, I don't care about that stuff. I need to win even though he doesn't know what the heck he's doing, like Jerry Jones does very often. And I think this is like one of those types of rules because technically we don't know exactly what he said, he said, she said, until it goes through a due process in a court of law. So they came up with this as a convenient way not to screw up saying two games, four games, six games type of deal. It's just you're out indefinitely. We'll figure it out later, but you're not coming back. And, and, and I guess that's the right thing to do. I wish there was a simpler or maybe a clearer solution for these types of issues. But it, you know what I think is that the NFL is really dumb for saying, oh, look at these three guys, Von Miller, Rashi Rice over in the offseason, Jabril Peppers. Oh, well, you know, that's really bad, but we're down by 50% in the last 10 years of, of these guys getting arrested. So it's not really so bad what they did. Not the right time to try to give that PR message, in my opinion. That That's just really kind of cold and calculated by the NFL. And, I think they miscalculated. You shouldn't be talking like that right you when someone Mahomes was clearly hurt. By the way, you see him running into the Yankee fan. I guess it's one of his boys running into well, the Well, he has fans. part ownership of the Royals. So yeah. Not part ownership. He has like a, not even 5%. I mean, give me a break. He's jumping around. He's a Met fan. He should be happy that the Mets won, not jumping around in a Kansas City Royals freaking jersey. I, I don't understand that. <laughs> that so, makes me want to, That makes me even want to see the Royals go down tonight. So let's get him out. Let's get him out so we can stick it. We, we, we need Wes and Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> I mean, Be seriously. Before we move on, I, I came up with a solution for all of these, you know, commissioners exempt list types of guys. By the way, this, this is, is what. By the way, I'm sorry to cut you off. Holmes, you brought Holmes in. That's the perfect guy when there's a man on third to bring in. Oh, what a great management. Look, he's going to walk this guy too. Is it, this is ridiculous. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just sick. I hate watching the fo damn baseball football games of my teams during the show. It makes me sick to my stomach. Oh, you should have seen the Week 15 Jets game. Makes me sick. I can't sit and watch this. I don't remember man. I've seen him that angry. I can't sit and watch this. This is this is so, just absolutely ridiculous. Well, let me cheer you up a little bit. I got a solution for all these commissioner exempt list guys. This is what you do. You make them go mano y mano with the big Hawaiian. And oh, slap yeah. boxing, kaboom! Right in the face. You got no shot. This is what you your punishment is. You got to deal with this, and and then maybe we'll think about letting you come back. You got to go up against the big Hawaiian right here. Look at that smack, unreal. Look, in all seriousness, it's a huge problem in an epidemic. I wish there was a simple solution, but they've got to do something. There's got to be more outreach. They've got to be really hard coming down on these guys so that they don't just let guys, you know, have a little slap on the wrist and be able to come back. And I think that's been going on for way too long, boys. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think the idea of the indefinite suspension is that bad. Like, make it, make it, send in a message. You cannot be on the field. You cannot be on the premises of the of the franchise. Ray Rice dealt with it. Adrian Peterson dealt with it. 
it's not hard to do, but yet they're throwing out all the, like you said, fish, they're calculating and miscalculating all these different numbers. All right. This guy's suspended for four games. Josh Brown got only got one game and I think the giants eventually cut him later in the season. But that was a really bad look for, for the giants and for the, the NFL. So it just makes no sense. It's an absolute embarrassment. What I'm watching right now with this Yankee game, it is embarrassment. It, it really is. I, I cannot sit here and watch this team just completely fall apart right on national television. It, it just, and you put, Clay Holmes in. You put Holmes in. It just doesn't make any sense. None of it does. I, I I stick up for this guy all the time. This is a ridiculous move. And if he gets a hit here, and I believe that that the Yankees are in a lot of trouble. I bet you before this inning is over, it's four to two. I that's that's where this game is going. And the Yankees are going to lose this game, and it's going to be another game that you know Aaron Boone is going to be shaking his head where he should have said, you know what. He just gave up that run. I'm pulling him out right now before he puts him, it puts himself in harm's way. It, it just makes no sense. And why bring in Clay Holmes when there is a guy on third base? He is the worst guy under pressure to bring in. <laughs> it's a pop up. Oh, uh, we got lucky on this there one. Is a guy. Uh, you know what? I, I think our guest the other uh, on uh, Monday, Jimmy Larrett, said it best. They're they're just doing pure analytics out here. They're not letting Aaron Boone just use his eyes and say, "Hey, Clark Schmidt's washed up right now. Let's get him out of here." And maybe Clay Holmes shouldn't come in with a runner on third base. We're going to get lucky if that's the case if we're getting out. Maybe we should use him, you know, in less pressure situations since. And, he's and, and by the out. way, and, and Keith, you say Clay Holmes has been great. Good, he's been great. And every time there is a man on third base, and that's probably him. It is him. I, I don't care what he says. L listen, before he even comes on, because yeah. we're not talking about the Yankees. And we're not talking about Clay Holmes. So, Keith, if you're calling about the Yankees, when we get into baseball, we're not going off target for you to get into the Clay Holmes thing. I'm going to tell you this. I don't give a crap what Clay Holmes is doing over the last past month. What I do remember of Clay Holmes, when a man is on third base and they bring him in in the eighth or ninth inning, he chokes. He chokes. So I don't care. And what I've been watching, you've been telling me how good Clay Holmes has looked over the last past month. I could give a crap. So if you're calling about the Yankees, don't call. I don't want to hear about it right now. I don't want to hear it. So put him on. If, if he's talking, he, uh, he hung up. <laughs> all right, good. Because I don't want to talk about the Yankees. I don't want to talk about the Yankees. There is no way I'm getting into the Yankees right now when there's other things that we want to talk about. Okay. I am, I am sick and tired. And, and by the way, I, I do, you know, he was supposed to call me after he went to visit a friend. I, we had, we were on the phone with Jeff and he kisses Jeff's ass. Man. You want to talk about a guy that kisses Jeff's ass? That's Keith. Keith Rooney. I love Keith. He's a father figure to me. Nice guy. Okay. But whenever he gets on the phone and I put him on the phone with Jeff, he just wants to, I'm surprised he doesn't lick his ass. I, I'm, I'm dead, dead serious. I've never seen somebody go all over the place. I've never seen anything like it. It makes me sick. Okay. I'm just saying. Would, would Keith use the skin flute on Jeff though? I think he's used to skin food on Jeff <laughs> in his own private area. Maybe in his, his own dreams, him and him and Jeff are nice, nice buddies. By the way, uh, what is he saying right? Love your real uh, G-Man era. Uh, Errol, thank you. Thank you, uh, Long Brain TV. Oh, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, that's Kenny. I don't know if that that's is, Kenny. That's Kenny's uh, one of his shows. I think his name Long Brain TV. I don't know. I, I didn't even know. I would know if you chase the geese on that one. So no, I, I'm just honest, honest to God. When 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 you see the situation that the NFL has been in, and by, by the way, look at Patrick Mahomes sitting on his ass now. You, you know, look at him, look at him, look at him. Go running to his friend and hitting him and bumping into. I don't even know who that is. Does anybody know? I think at first I thought it was Travis Kelsey, but it's not. No, but it, it's it's got to be one of his pals. I don't know who it is, but uh, he's not. He obviously knows that you know it doesn't look good for the New York Yankees. But anyways. Um, I think the NFL needs to look more deeper into this. I think they need to realize that this situation is unclear and the NFL needs to figure out how to make it more clear to these players that if you put your hands on a woman, you are going to be suspended for the season. And if uh, the men dem uh, demanding that they don't do it, and if it's even worse than they think it is, that they should either be thrown out of football or being you know, suspended without a certain amount of time of pay 
in in a, in a two year span. I don't know how they're going to figure this out, but there has to be something put together where these players realize that if they do something wrong on and off the field, that they're going to, they're going to pay for it, and they're they think that they are invincible and they can get away. Ask Tyreek Hill. Ask Tyreek Hill on some of the things yeah. that he's done. Mm-hmm. Okay. He Tyreek Hill is like a little of nothing. I mean, how big is Tyreek Hill? Five seven, five eight. He he's going out there smacking people up because he's Tyreek Hill. I mean, seriously. Yeah, there was because those, he's a multi-millionaire. Yeah, there were two of them last year alone. There was that there was that woman that uh, beat uh, her son beat her in a route or something like that. Him beat him in a route or something, and then uh, something happened, and then there was that Marina the employee. So yeah, uh, yeah you're gonna brush that. Yeah, up. that's that story was crazy when we did it, Speedy. It, the woman, he, he was like. It, her, her son was in his all-star camp and he was hitting on the woman and they were, he was like, Oh, let's do one-on-ones. And she like press coverage him and actually knocked him back. So she, he's like next rep, like, was like, Oh yeah, you're going to hit me. Like he like actually hurt her, like trying to like get back at her. It's just, it's just crazy. The stuff that some of these guys are think is okay. It's just crazy. And nah, I'm not surprised they're know, NFL man. players and they have millions and millions of dollars. Look, John Carlos Dan again, another hit. He could buy a hit, but Aaron judge can't, it doesn't make sense. How does Aaron man. judge? Does Aaron judge have one hit in this series? Does he one. even have a hit? He was over nine. I don't think he's gotten anything. No, he has his batting average. He's still got a batting average. So he's got one hit. He's got a couple of walks and that's it. He looks it's terrible. Horrible. He's pressing. It's just horrible. It it's horrible to watch. It really is. And if the Yankees lose this series and this guy can't buy a hit, what are the fans going to say in the offseason? I mean, this guy is not a winner. This guy can't. I, I'm not going to doubt him, though. I we saw we've saw the the best baseball season. Yeah, in the last regular 25 season, years this year. But when it comes to the, playoffs, I know he chokes. And let's I, see. I can't. Yeah, let's see. And, and again, the Yankees. When it comes to relief pitching, I'm not going to bet on the Yankees relief pitching over of Kansas City. That's what bothers me about. This game, it, it's just, it, it's, if it's one-on-one back-to-back, I it just, I don't see it. I, I would love to see the Yankees shove it down, you know, Patrick Mahomes' throat. I would love <laughs> to see it, but, uh, you know, you know, and I know that it doesn't usually work in the Yankees' favor. It hasn't done that in over, I don't know, over the tw- last 20 years, it hasn't worked in the Yankees' favor. Only in 2009, which, uh, you know, a uh, hot Alex Rodriguez, that was the what changed everything. So maybe that's what you have to hope for over there and judge. Maybe he has one of those years, like after five really bad ones. It's maybe just, it's because he's there. The Royals get all the calls now. <laughs> you know, like that's that's well, a big the, the one that was skill. reviewed for a while was a foul ball. I thought it was, but it was close. But yeah. uh, they just had to call up Patrick and see if it was OK with him. That's all yeah. it is, you know. Yeah. Now, now the real question, will we, will we get West Cam like we did with the Alabama game? Mm. The Padres lead in the NLDS two to one over the Dodgers after winning game three in San Diego, six to five. There was a controversy of Manny Machado fired a baseball in the director of the di- direction of Dave Roberts, which Machado denied he did on purpose. The Tigers lead the Guardians two to one after winning game three in Detroit. If the Tigers and the Mets both win their series, which the Mets did. Four out of the six teams that were number six seeds would reach the conference championship since MLB, since the MLB expanded the playoffs in 2022. The Yankees will pitch Clark Schmidt, which they are tonight, versus the Royals and Seth Lugo, which we've seen both pitchers pulled out, as we have just seen. And by the way, two outs, man on first for the Yankees, and they're pulling. Who's that right there? Number 61? I don't know. Uh, Zerpa. I don't know uh, Garrett Cole has been announced uh, as the game four starter for the New York Yankees win or lose, which is a good sign because Garrett Cole's numbers away are some of the best in baseball. So uh, I, I think a Garrett Cole away is better than a Garrett Cole at home. So I guess you're going to see Luis Heal in game number five if it goes to a game. You're not going to see Carlos Rodon. I, I think the Yankees would be smart enough to keep him off the mound at Yankee Stadium. but. Here's the thing. Congratulations to the New York Mets, by the way. Congratulations. I, I'm happy for the Mets and the Mets fans. I know they're they're going to be all over social media if the Yankees lose. And ha, 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 ha. We swept you 4-0, and now we're going to the NLCS. Listen, I am, I'm so happy for the Mets. And the Mets fans should be happy. But here's the problem with the Mets. And I'm going to say this honest to God truth. Oh, if the Mets weren't here, all the Mets fans were talking about is the offseason and how much money they're going to spend. That's all I hear. 
We're going to go after Soto. We're going to go after Burns. We're going to go after this guy and that guy. And uh, we have Steve Cohen. Now what are you going to do in the offseason? Are you going to pay Pete Alonso? Because I know a lot of the Met fans told me a couple of weeks ago that no way in hell do we pay Pete Alonso. But guess what? Pete Alonso has three home runs in the playoffs and helped you beat Milwaukee. And now it just helped you beat Philadelphia. So now, in the offseason, do you pay Pete Alonso? Because he's a game winning player in the playoffs. The answer would be, yes, I would. Okay? Yes, I would. So I don't want to hear from the Met fans, we're not overpaying him. We're not. The guy helps you win. You paid Lindor, you got to pay Alonzo. And now, what do the Mets do in the offseason, win or lose? If the, if the Mets win the World Series, do you go out and spend a ton of money for players when you don't need it? I wouldn't. But, you know, Uncle Stevie is all about that. He loves to spend money. He hasn't last year, this past year. And by the way, it was probably the best thing the Mets ever did. Now, the, the thing is with the Mets is they got to they gotta stay the course. And, and the Yankees in the 90s, they stood the curve. They, they stayed the course. They kept their veterans. They built around their youth. Uh, what do they call that? The, the core four. Or I would say core five. People forget how good Bernie Williams was, but he came before them. I mean, they had a core five of players, and they built around those players and brought in veteran players that can play. The Mets should be doing the same thing right now. They have a bunch of young players right now. Nimmo, who's not young anymore, but he's still a player that came from their farm system. They have this kid, uh, uh, Mark uh, Vientos. Vientos. He looks like a player. Pete Alonzo is another player that the, the Mets have brought, you know, obviously drafted and built their team around. They have players that they're they're coming from the farm system and they're building around the farm system. That's what the Mets need to continue doing. Stop going out there and spending money. But I'm not even done. Congratulations to them. I don't want to talk about the offseason until the season is over for the New York Mets. It, it, it's a sensational thing. I would love to see both New York teams go, one go in the ALCS and the other one go in the NLCS. Maybe you see another Subway Series. Who knows? That would be fun to watch. It really would. It would be great for New York. It really would. I mean, as a Yankee fan, I don't want to see it because I don't want to see if the Mets beat the Yankees, you won't hear the end of it. Luis Torrens walk off home run. <laughs> you wouldn't hear the end of it from the Mets fans ever. Even if the Yankees win three, four World Series after that, it won't matter. We beat the Yankees in 2024. That's what you're going to hear. But nevertheless, I, I think that if you're uh, a Met fan, you should be excited. I think they match up very well against the Padres. They match up very well right now against the Dodgers. And if it is the Padres, you're 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 seeing the two hottest teams in baseball head off to the NLCS and and may the best team win. Mm -hmm. The Mets were the hottest have been the hottest team in baseball I think since May 30th, and the Padres are the hottest team in baseball since the All Star break. So definitely going to create an interesting dichotomy and kind of I different identities too. Like the Padres, they're scoring early. Like you you saw them put like five runs on the board last night against the Dodgers and they almost blew it because they allowed a grand slam after that, but their bullpen held their own. The Padres bullpen has been besides probably Cleveland, the next best in baseball after that. And the starting rotation is very good. The Mets have done it with like scrap Pete pitchers, ex Padres. They're Manaya. not scrap Pete pitchers. They've, they've proven that they're not. And Manaya is a good pitcher. He's been a successful pitcher in the league. They have successful. Kitana has been a successful pitcher for what? Almost 20 years of his career in the major leagues. So to say that they're scrap Pete pitchers, they're not. They're not. I'm so tired of hearing that from the Med fans. That's not true. And you bring up a good point, too, with the offseason when it comes to, like, the big spending. Like, I think the Mets, in those types of years, a la 2022, when they went out and got hey, Max Scherzer. Hey, Pete Alonzo. Yeah. When they, got, when they went out and got Max Scherzer, when they gave Lindor, they gave Lindor the contract before that, but they spent on all those older hitters. Like, it didn't work. That wasn't baseball anymore. It's becoming a younger game. And now they're finally embracing the younger players this year. Besides Brett Beatty, like, everyone else that were top prospects have developed. And you even saw them bring up Acuna at the end of the year when Lindor got hurt. And he's gotten a lot of confidence. He had a couple hits in the Brewer series as well. So you're seeing that kind of thing be a real culture change for them kind of thing, too. And I think you need to have them avoid that kind of reckless spending that you're 
you're going to see that you're going to see the Mets do in the past. And the Dodgers have done that recently. And where has it gotten them? It hasn't really done much for them in the playoffs. They're down two to one and they still can't pitch to save their lives. And the Mets are doing it with these gems pitchers that they find. And, and they, they beat the Phillies, a team that everybody thought was going to the World Series and yep. had a chance to win the World Series. They couldn't buy a hit in that series, as well as the Yankees can't buy a hit against Kansas City. And that's what happens when you're a good team and you're a playoff contending team. You find a way to get a hit. The Mets have done that. They have been one of the hottest hitting teams in baseball. So have the Padres. And that's why they're both. I, I, I believe the Padres will end the game, end the season for the Dodgers this uh, this coming tonight. Uh, what, what time are they starting? They should be starting any, any minute now. I think it's 9.08 or something. Whatever. whatever. Yeah. They're going to be starting soon. I think they're going to be. I think they're going to beat the uh, Dodgers no matter what. And, and that's what you're going to see in the NLCS. As far as the American League. Uh, the Guardians down right now uh, to the Tigers, two games to one. I'm not surprised. The Tigers are a surprise team. They've got Scruble, who's been one of the best pitchers in baseball, probably going to win the Cy Young in the American League. I, I, I'm I, not surprised at what you see right now. And by the way, Cabrera's up 2-2. He's probably going to strike out. The Yankees have first and second. And by the way, Giancarlo actually stole a base. Before we move on, I, I did want to mention, uh, uh, first off, it's always like one of the – the hot wild card teams from each league that always goes far. I don't know if it's going to be the Tigers or it's the Royals, but it's going to be one of them. And the Mets are clearly that team on the other side in the, in the NL. The guy that's the most impressive in the playoffs right now is Fernando Tatis Jr. Okay. Fernando Tatis Jr. is hitting 560 with four home runs, 10 hits and 18 at bats, just dominating bad, over there. Oh my God. I thought that honestly, I never thought they'd have a chance at Soto. I thought they'd have more of a chance at Tatis after the suspension, the shoulder issues. I thought he'd be more available than a guy like Soto. Turns out uh, they decided to hold on to him. He became a pretty good fielding outfielder after starting at shortstop. And he's stayed a little bit healthier and he looks pretty awesome right now. So, and the Dodgers being hurt, Freddie Freeman's not playing tonight in a must win game. He must be really hurt trying to get out there. Their whole staff is hurt. Kershaw's not coming back. You know, Bueller, like all these guys. It's they're it's amazing they were able to piece it together to get to this point. Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's that. And the Mets fans, thank you for blowing up. You know, my phone with all of your your celebratory things, uh, celebrating your team. That. Congratulations. We'll give it to you. I heard it. All right. We'll talk about the next round. Maybe we get I'd to love that to subway see series. It'd be wonderful. Out of here, I would love to see it. I mean, Verdugo lost his spot uh, after Dominguez came back. He earned his spot back uh, at the end of the season, and then go out there and smack another ball out there. I mean, that would be nice to yeah. watch. I, I don't. I'm not going to predict that to happen. But hey, you know, anything's possible. Uh, NBA insider Mark Stein reports that several executives have told him that Giannis and Jimmy Butler are two next NBA superstars likely to be traded. And by the way, he's out. Uh, Stein says Butler is likely to enter free agency next off season, even though he has a player option for uh, that will earn him $53 million reports earlier. This off season said that Jimmy Bu uh, buckets would not extend the heat this season after the beef he had with Pat Riley reports say many teams will be ready to aggressively go after Giannis if the Bucs start to unravel uh, again with Doc Rivers, the Bucs have only won one playoff series since their championship run in 2021. Well, Giannis is a big name. He's a very interesting name. I thought Giannis would have been likely to go to the Knicks. I didn't. No, no. Obviously, Carl Anthony Towns has always wanted to be here. This is his hometown. He lived in New Jersey his whole life, and he grew up a New York Knicks fan. So, I, I mean, he's coming home. It might change everything for him. He is a great player, but he could be he could be something even more interesting. Uh, you know, coming back to New York, Giannis is a guy that's very interesting and very intriguing because of what he has done over the last couple of years. I still think he's a top five player. And I think Milwaukee has, you know, aggressively uh, tried to bring in a player to play with him. Now, they still have, obviously, Dame, Dame time there. But Dame is on his final year of his contract. Is he going to stay there? There were stories coming out that he would have liked to go to Miami or go to a playoff contending team. So it, it's very interesting right now to see the position that... Uh, the Milwaukee Bucks are in this year. Now, this is their year. If they if they can stay healthy with Dame and this this roster can figure things out and maybe make a trade at the trade deadline, maybe they can compete for a championship. But I think they're done. I think their run is over. I think 
Giannis believes their run is over. As far as Jimmy Buckets are concerned, it's Miami's run has been over for about two years. This is a team that's getting older. Uh, Bam is their best player. Uh, maybe they build around Bam. Maybe they go uh, and look to, to try to build around the draft in the future. But they're still good enough to make the playoffs. So they're not going to have a, you know, they're not going to get a franchise player unless they get lucky in in the draft at number 15, number 16, or even in the, the, the late teens. So now you sit here and you're wondering, where does where does Miami go now that Pat Riley and him are not getting along? And my opinion is, if I was Pat Riley, if this team starts off slow, I'd move. Jimmy Buckets, try to get as much as I possibly can for him. Maybe get a young player from another roster. Maybe you stin one of these teams that are willing to trade one of their top young players. OKC could trade Williams or one of those guys to bring in Jimmy Buckets because they think they're one player away from winning the championship. And we all know Jimmy is a completely different player in the playoffs. Maybe that's the way they go. But right now, I just think that the position that both these organizations are in, they're, they're very close. I mean, Milwaukee's not in a rebuilding stage, but they're almost there because they have no depth. Right. And Miami, they are kind of in the rebuilding stage right now. They don't really have anything besides Bam and Jimmy. I mean, they have nothing. I don't want to hear about, you know, Mr. Three-Point Shooter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and They're just – they don't have enough now where I think – Miami should look to trade Jimmy Buckets and get – remember, Jimmy's 35, 36 years old at the tail end of his career, maybe two good, two more good years at best. I, I think that if you're a Miami Heat fan, you can only hope that they move on from Jimmy Buckets this coming season than sitting back and waiting for it to completely fall apart. Yeah, quickly before we get uh, Chad's on for Let's Park. By the way, Aaron Judge is up. <laughs> Aaron Judge is up. We'll see if he gets a second hit of the series. Uh, quickly, just – both teams are in their downward trajectory right now. Not ideal circumstances. You're right. The Bucs have lost a lot of depth. They've lost a lot of size that maybe they wanted to get back from the offensive standpoint. And Miami is just dealing with all these guys just being so fragile outside of Bam Adebayo. Like Tyler Hero, once he got his contract, has not been the same player. Duncan Robinson's contract is really bad right now. And they've had trouble moving it. They got late. They got out of Kyle Lowry, which was pretty lucky. But still, it's... Pat Kyle Robinson. Lowry's old. Yeah, no. But, but that contract... the same player he was. No, I know. I know that. And And... That contract with Miami was really bad. They got out of it. He went to Philly last year. But Pat Riley's going to have to do a lot of master class in order to make that kind of thing work. As far as the Bucks, yeah, they really need to figure something out to either keep him there, get more a player that he wants to play with to stay there, or they're going to have to trade him next offseason easily. Uh, the the Royals are bringing in a starting pitcher to face Judge Brady Singer right now. That's interesting. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. Jimmy Buckets, it's a real thing, the playoff Jimmy mentality. For all the, uh, I was down in Florida, and and by the way, everyone in Florida, really be safe right now. I hope you guys are able to evacuate everyone on the west coast of Florida. Uh, a bunch of friends out there, guys. We, I know I've heard from most of you. If I haven't heard from you, but all our best wishes for you. Please stay safe with the Hurricane Milton out there. Uh, but look, Jimmy Buckets, he's getting older. He's almost my age. It's amazing he's been able to be this good this long. He's getting hurt a little bit more now. It should not be surprising. But this is the team that has the best coach in the league in Eric Spolscher. And Eric Spolscher isn't going to just say, oh, let's let's tear it down. It's going to be a reload type of a thing. They always seem to find a way to hover around playoff contention no matter what because they have great coaching and they have a great front office with Pat Riley. They will figure it out. You know Jimmy Buckets will get moved. They'll get some kind of future asset that's ready sooner than people think because they just know how to craft guys. I, I really like what they did with Haquez in the draft uh, not so long ago. He was a nice steal. Uh, I think it was just after the lottery they got him, or his late lottery, one of the two. And he's, you know, they just find these guys and they develop them. So it's not surprising that they're always in contention. They need to move on from them. As far as the Bucks, I, I don't know about Giannis. Giannis is such a great player. He's, you know, he signed long-term, but Dame is near the end as well. Same as Jimmy Buckets, maybe not as old, but very close. And those guys, when they're undersized guards like Dame is, it goes faster than a guy like Jimmy Buckets. So I'm really concerned for the Bucks. Giannis will take him as far as he can. But again, Giannis has some limitations late in the game uh, with not being a great shooter. So uh, you, you wonder what's going to happen. I Like you said, Errol, I thought he was a good candidate for the Knicks before Towns was traded to them. It just would have cost a lot more than what the, what the Knicks ended up paying for Towns. So... I'm glad they didn't have to give up more than that, and I'm glad the Knicks look like a real top three contender, according to Vegas, number three odds to win the NBA championships. I don't know when the last time that was. We call this segment Let's Parlay.
All right, Chaz Wes is over there at the Kansas City Royals game, enjoying himself, getting drunk, probably you know, doing other things in the boys' bathroom. He did send know. some picks, though, so I will give them out to you too, Chaz. Oh, good for him. Anyways, uh, hopefully they lose because I don't want to hear him after the game. But anyways, Chaz, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? I guess it's yes. uh, that game's tied at two, right? Yes, we hear you. Yes, the Basically, Padres. Yes. That, no, no, I'm talking about the uh, the Yankees games tied at two. Yes, yes. tied at two. Yeah, I, I've been I've been watching. My kid's at the game tonight, so he's at game. Uh, What's well, it? Game four. So I'm watching his dog. So I had to go pick up his dog. Um, but the um, the uh, Mets game was amazing, wasn't it? Holy cow, just amazing. Good for the Mets. So I'm you guys don't you guys you guys don't know. You know, as you know, I'm back from back there, and and if you knew me as a kid, I was the diehard Mets fan, diehard Mets fan. But um, there was a strike once, and the guy that was pissing and moaning, they showed his batting average. He was he was making like 980. He was making $980,000. He was batting like 178, and that was it. I was done with baseball from that moment. I have not – I own – the only hat – I only own one hat, as you guys know probably, because you've heard me say the story. It was a Mets hat, and then it became a, an Aztecs hat, and then it remains an Aztecs hat. But it was, it was definitely an exciting game. There's no doubt about it. And there's no question, and if you're – Again, a Mets fan, you should be excited. The Mets are heading to the world yeah. of the NLCS yeah. and have a chance possibly to go to the World Series. They haven't been there since 2000. Well, you know, they, could, they could be showing up right here, right? Yeah, well, I maybe. I, I mean, obviously. If well, Padres, I mean, Padres, Padres got to win one of two. That's You got to win one of two. You'd rather win tonight, though, I think, if you were a Padre. You know what? Because if you go back to L.A., they'll throw things at you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to get into that. But are you ready to make your picks? Oh, I, I am. So so what I did last week, remember, I, I, Wednesdays just ain't working for me. I, I, God bless those guys that can be ready on Wednesday. When I was getting paid to write, I was ready on Wednesday because I had no choice. But right now, I'm just chasing my tail. But So last week, I ended up going six and four. But, uh, Peter, you might remember the uh, there was the second half that went over in a game. And I won it on a weird play. What was it? Was it a, a two-point conversion? That's what it was. It was on a two-point oh, yeah, conversion. Tell me about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I did the same thing this week it was with, I, you know, there was a coin flip on, on, on the trends that I was betting, but the one that came up twice was San Francisco in the first half team total to score. And they, they, I won it on a blocked field goal. Now how many blocked field goals were there this weekend? Two, right? Came back for touchdowns. I think you never see that in the, on the guys that get paid on Sundays, you know? Yes. So, uh, so it, it's funny because it really becomes a, a the whole how you bet versus who you bet. You, you got to pick and choose your numbers and, and, and catch I mean, like uh, last night, you saw it with Wes. We, I caught over 10 and a half and under 15 and a half in that game. They scored 11 runs and then they didn't score again. So that, that right there is part of the reason why I, I really do love sports betting. But I came up with four plays for you. Um, these are my four abbreviated plays. I will have these plays. They may not be big, big plays by the time I finish handicapping, but I'm starting with Jacksonville's team total under. That's for the game. The reason I'm doing that is because last week we had Chicago that in the game they allowed 21 or less in 10 of 10. It's now 11 of 11. And so they're playing Chicago. Jacksonville, as you know, his offense is sputtering to say the least. So we're going to stick with that one. And then we're coming right back with San Francisco team total over. Now you guys know Vicky's a big Baltimore fan. and. We watch the games together. So she didn't understand why I was so excited on that block punt for a touchdown, a block field goal for a touchdown, when I didn't care after that. So the second the game was on in the second half, and I wanted nothing to do with it because the bet was only for the first half. And guess what? I look like a genius because I don't think the 49ers scored again. We were, I'm going with the over in the Washington Baltimore game for two reasons. You may know that Vicky's a big Baltimore fan. And they got no defense. People are running up and down the field on her, on them, and on her, on them. Uh, and Washington just came out of Cleveland. That was a, an over, uh, but that was a, a Cleveland trend. I'm sticking with the over in this game. The kid is playing real well. I mean, he, he looks like, you know, Cy Young winner or, or what you call it, a uh, Heisman winner. He, he, he's doing all the right things. 
That team has been down. Remember, I'm old enough to remember when Washington was good. I don't think either you two could do that. And then finally, I got Detroit. Now, Detroit is the a game. This is the only game of these four that has nothing to do with the trends because I haven't looked yet. So I glanced while I was listening to Eric. Yeah, I've always liked that guy. He just, he, he's got a good tone. He's smart. He says good things. Um, I, I just really enjoyed it. So, but while he was talking, I was looking. And Detroit's 10-2 and two against the spread on the road. But here's the thing. This is I'm pissed at you bet because Dallas screwed me. I had Pittsburgh in the second half. What was that, Monday night? I love football season. We got football every day for, what, 45 days now or something? Mm -hmm. Right? Because there's Tuesday back action, Wednesday's the other action. But the I had Pittsburgh, and, and I just needed the game to end, and they let Dallas march down the field, and Dallas scored and won, and I lost. Both bets. I lost the second half under, and I lost the Pittsburgh bet. So I'm coming back with Detroit, just hoping that Dallas will come back to reality because I'm not a big fan of the Cowboys. All so right. those are my four plays. All right. So uh, Wes had these uh, five plays, actually. Uh, he has the Browns plus eight and a half. He's got the Bears minus two and a half. He's got his Ohio State Buckeyes over 13.5 in the first half. He's got Rutgers minus two and a half, and he's got the New York Jets on the money line. I think I would bet the uh, Jets too. I, I I would bet. I've said it already. I, I think the, honestly, and I know why he went with the Jets. New coach, and usually he, that's the way he goes when you, you have a new. Coach. You get a bump. You get a bump, no doubt. So, and I I think that the Jets are going to play for uh, Ulbrick, which they haven't been doing over over the last couple of weeks for Salah. I think they're going to be a different team, a different offense going in uh, to. Uh, the next game on Monday Night Football with Buffalo. But, uh, Chaz, thank you for joining us, as always. Hey, well, one quick before I let you go. Saturday, we've got our annual two games one day. I didn't go last year because I was in New Orleans at the Tulane game. But we're going up in the morning. We're going to go to the Coliseum. We're going to see USC and Penn State. And then we're going, right, and then we're going to the Rose Bowl in the evening. And we're going to see Minnesota and the Bruins. And we're excited. Mm -hmm. Very nice. That's a 14 parlay. I got to figure out what it is, though. <laughs> Chaz, thank Always you. Always be passing, guys. Let's go to a quick break. When we come back, I know he's been waiting patiently. We will be we will be talking to the Texas Rangers AAA infielder, Jax Biggers. This is the Sports Wild Mouth. 631-672-3108 is the number to call. You're listening to the Sports Wild Mouth. I'm your host, Daryl Marks, my co-host, Speedy. Petey, go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. Check out all those shows throughout the week, including the Loud Mouth with me and Speedy Petey every single Mondays and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. All you have to do to tune in and check out our local listings for all our shows is go to our website at www.worldwidesportsradio.com. He's been waiting patiently, and uh, I'd like to invite him in as uh, he's probably watching the Yankee game, too. I don't know why. I'm going to just let everybody know. Yes, the Yankees are up three to two, but it's still going to be the bottom of the eighth, and they have six more outs they need to get out. So before the Yankees win this game, if they win this game. So I, I'm not going to bet on it yet, but let's just hope it works out. But anyways, we are now talking to Texas Rangers AAA infielder, our friend, Jax Bigger. Jax, what's hey, up, buddy? What's up, fellas? Good to see you all again. Well, it's uh, good to see you, my friend, as your Texas Rangers won a World Series last year. They didn't make the playoffs this year. So maybe uh, we'll see you in the majors a lot sooner than later. But, uh, I, you know, it's so crazy watching playoff baseball. It, you can't predict. I think it's the only sport you cannot predict when a team gets into the playoffs, how far are they going to go, if they're going to win, or are they going to be one and done in a wild card series? I, you just don't know. And baseball is so unpredictable. Are you surprised the way uh, the the playoffs have gone so far? Are you surprised right now that all the number ones could be knocked out in the NL the NLDS and the NL the NLCS? I mean the NL the NLDS. I'm sorry, the right. NLDS, yeah. what I'm talking about divisional series. Uh, yeah, very very not not very surprised because I, I feel like playoffs is just was ever hot, um, and every team in the playoffs is a good team, obviously. But it's just weird that you like the Yankees are the one seed and the Dodgers are the one seed. And we both know that like they're the best in their side for sure. But then it's like, okay, well, the Padres are playing the Dodgers 
and they were just two games back from the regular season record of the, of the Dodgers. So it's like there's not really like a huge gap between like the top and the bottom who are in the playoffs. And so I think just whoever hot is going to get rolling and, you know, baseball is baseball. And, and now you got the Mets who were like this close from not making playoffs and now they're they're going to the uh, NLCS. So it's, it's crazy. It really is crazy. They get hot. And, and, and the Mets yeah. got hot at the right time. I think the last two months of baseball – Besides the Padres, they were just lightning hot. And and w- wouldn't it be fitting that the two hottest teams in baseball going into the playoffs, the Padres and the Mets meet up at the NLCS. And and then I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Royals in Detroit go to the ALCS. <laughs> and, and who would have thought Detroit versus Kansas City in, right. in the, you know, the NL, ALCS to fight to go and represent the American League? It's not. It's not, it's unusual, but it's the only sport it would happen. It wouldn't happen in hockey. I'm sorry, hockey fans. And everybody keeps saying hockey is the hardest sport to win a championship. That is not true. I, I absolutely believe baseball is the hardest just because of the way baseball is set up. And, and it's really about who's hot at the proper time. Yep. Yep. H- hockey's tough, but I, I don't know much about hockey. I'm a Texas guy, so it's not cold enough for me to know have my knowledge uh, wrapped around hockey at all. So uh, in addition to the like lower seed movement, we've also seen younger teams be a, a big movement ever since the lockout, the new rules in place for even some of the drafts and you being a, a younger player who was on an organization that uh, won a world series. Like, do you think that movement is going across baseball where you're seeing teams like the Mets who are once an old team now be a young team and do well, yeah. the Padres, same kind of thing. I think so. Um, I think just the game is so much younger now because I feel like teams don't want to don't want to pay certain players anymore who are older. Uh, the older guys they require more money, um, whereas you, you know you call up the twenty four the twenty four year old who's a rookie, you're paying him from age age twenty four to age twenty seven twenty eight the league minimum. Whereas you've got the thirty five to thirty seven year old, you got to pay him probably you know seven eight mil for for the year. So not saying who's better by stress or whatever, just saying I think the owners are, are starting to save a little money and the GMs are on board with that too. And I could be wrong. I probably, I'm, I'm usually wrong. So don't quote me, but that's just, you know, what it seems like the game's trending to be right now. We are talking to Texas Rangers AAA infielder Jax Biggers. Uh, Jax, you know, we, we talk about baseball and baseball is is so hard to predict. And again, I think the hardest thing to do in, in, in professional sports is go up to the plate and guess what pitch is coming. I, I, I've i never played in the minor leagues. I've never played in the majors. I did play, you know, high school ball. I, I've traveled over the years playing baseball. I, I've always find find it very difficult when you see a guy throw, when you're trying to predict what when a curveball is coming, when a changeup's coming, when a fastball's coming. It, it's, it's so unpredictable. What is it like standing up at the plate and sitting and you're waiting, you're sitting on a fastball, you're trying to sit on a curveball and it doesn't come. Yeah, you just, uh, if you're going to sit on a pitch, you, you know, you, you hope you, you guess right. Um, if you guess right and it's a, it's a strike, you know, you want to try to get it, but it's just hard. You know, you, you really can't guess anymore or you can guess. But for me, guessing has never worked out well for me. I just try to be on time for the fastball and just react to anything slower. But if I'm on time for the curveball and they throw a fastball, I got no chance. So it's hard. Uh, I do think it's the hardest thing in sports. But you definitely got to be on time for the for the fastball, in my opinion. So the rule changes have been a big controversy the last three years, really, since the lockout. And, and, and a lot of obviously a lot of the rules are tested in the minor leagues and before mm-hmm. they're brought to the major leagues. So for you, is there any rules that you like that are new rules and any rules that you're adamantly against? Yeah, I, I love the pitch clock. Uh, I think it's great. You know, I you know four three or four years ago, games would take three hours and thirty minutes, and you'd call it a short game. And don't get me wrong, I I, I love playing baseball, but you know, games at seven o'clock, you don't finish till ten thirty. I'm there for almost twelve hours a day, which is you no know, no complaints again. But now the games are going you know two hours and thirty minutes, and sometimes you get a two hour and fifteen, and now you get a three hour game. It's like this game's kind of long, so it's nice. You know, we play so many games, it's nice to sometimes finish the game early get a real dinner with, with family because um, restaurants are still open now. So I, I love the pitch clock. The ABS, have you heard about the ABS challenge system kind of, right? Like the balls and strikes? A little bit, yeah. Um, 
they got they got like the challenge rule where each team gets three challenges. The pitcher, the catcher, or the hitter can call it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that rule. Uh, it takes away all the complaining. So you know, if, if I got a problem with the umpire and you know he's you know he's screwing me or whatever, I can just challenge it. If I'm right, I, it goes my way. And if I'm wrong, I can't complain. I gotta you know, I gotta shut up and swallow my tongue for a little bit. So I enjoy the challenge system. Uh, I enjoy the pitch clock. I really do enjoy all the new rules. Uh, I adapt to them pretty quick, pretty easy, as well as most of my teammates do. So I think it's going to be hopefully in the major leagues in the next two or three years. The the the, the challenge system, the pitch clock's already there. Well, you know, there, you know, my partner over here, he likes to swallow tongues. So uh, you know, just <laughs> you like to swallow your tongue. Speedy likes to swallow his. Uh, but uh, you know. The Rangers, uh, I'm very surprised that the Rangers didn't make the playoffs this year. They they won the World Series last year. Bruce Bochy, who I think is one of the best managers in baseball history, uh, he's been in the World Series with three different teams. How many managers have ever done that? I think he's the first to ever do that and, and win it with two different teams. It's pretty incredible what he has done. Um, why do you think they didn't make the playoffs this year? And what do they need to do in the offseason that can make them a contender again? Oh, uh, yeah. Good question. Have you heard of the Bochi effect? No, but you can give me the bro uh, the Bochi. I got you right here. The this, Broski this is like, this is, effect. No, the, the Bochi. With, I know. Uh, I call manager. it the Broski. Let's call it the oh, Broski. Oh, <laughs> the Broski effect. Okay, this is crazy. When Bochi won his first ring, the Giants, they won three in five years. They won it the next year below 500. The next year they won it the next year below 500. The next year they won it. So if the Bochy effect is in, is in, you know, in play with the Rangers, then I think this year going under 500, not went, not making it to the playoffs, is is in a good spot for next year. I don't know if you've heard this step before, but before he was with the Rangers, he announced his retirement with the Giants. During the season, at that at one point, he had a career managerial record of 1995 and 2019, which would have been the same year as he would have spanned managing. And I said, "Oh, that is crazy. Out, who needs 2,000 wins? That is a much better <laughs> step. He should have just retired after that game. I think it was in August or something like that. Just retire after that game. It would have been one of the coolest things. So that would crazy. Yeah, I wanted to ask about some of the younger players. I think you have experience playing with them in, in the minor leagues, too. Evan Carter was a big prospect for them. I think he was up and down between the majors and the minors this year. Uh, you saw somebody like Josh Smith play very well. Josh Young was a good rookie last year on the World Series team. So what is it like playing with them, and what are some of your impressions of them as players and teammates? Yeah, it's cool. Uh, I'm hoping Evan can get healthy. I know he struggled this year with a bunch of injuries. Um, so hopefully Evan gets healthy because he, he's crazy athletic, crazy talent. And also a really good kid, really good dude. Comes from a good family, so you root for Evan. Uh, played with Smitty for a year in Double A, and then played against him in college. Also another great dude. Um, comes from a great family, so it was really cool to see him have his first real success in the majors this year. I think his first like year and a half, not like a struggle, just he didn't get consistent at bats, and it's tough going from playing every day in the minor leagues to. Okay, you know, you're batting two hole, three hole. Now you go to the majors and you're, you know, you're hitting seven, eight, nine. You're playing Tuesday, Friday, Sunday. You know, nothing gets in a rhythm for him. And so it was really cool to see him this year get that rhythm, um, have that consistency. And y'all saw what he did when he got that. So um, kudos to Josh for taking advantage of, of, a, of an opportunity when he got it. And then Josh Young's a stud. Uh, he's been a stud since he got drafted. And just hopefully he can have a healthy, um, a full a full year of health, good off season with some more health, and then he comes back ready to bang next year. We are we were talking to Texas Rangers AAA infielder Jax Biggers. Uh, you've been playing in the minor leagues for a little while. Who's been the most impressive player have you seen in the last couple of years, and even this year? And who do you think that you've seen this year are is a future star in the major leagues? The most impressive players that I saw. Uh, in 2021, it was Bobby Witt's first full season in the minor leagues. So he was 18, 19 in double A. I was 23 or 24, give or take. And uh, it was stupid. He was hitting balls off the batter's eyes. And I was like, this kid's supposed to be a freshman in college. And he's doing things that nobody on, on, on the field could do but him. Uh, and then the year after that, I played against Corbin Carroll for a full season, and he had a crazy year. 
so those two are the most impressive I got to see um, for a full season. Just like the things they did were just – everything was electric. Uh, I don't know. It's just like you can't really describe it. It's just they're different. And then what was the last question? Uh, oh, oh, this, this year. year I think. This year. Who's, who, this do year. You, who did you see this year that was the most impressive? And, and who do you think is a future star in the majors? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, the Astros had a, or, or the Sugar Land, their AAA team, uh, Shea Whitcomb, mm -hmm. which he ended up debuting this year, the Astros, but he was in the minors, I think for like majority of the first half or like majority of the whole year. But his year was crazy. I think he had like 30 homers in Sugar Land where the ball doesn't fly very well. Um, but it felt like every time he was up to, up to the plate, he hit the ball hard. Mm -hmm. So I give, I give it to Shea. I think, I think he'll, uh, translate to the big leagues very well and um, continue to hit. So my team, the Mets, have a, a guy that used to be in the Rangers farm system with Luis, Luis Angel. Acuna. Oh, yeah, Luis. Um, yep. I don't know if you've had any experiences with him, but if you have, what if, what is he like as a teammate? And uh, are you surprised that he came up with the Mets and played well at the end of the year? Yeah, I played with Louis, um, last. So last year he got traded when we were in double together from the Rangers to the Mets for Scherzer. And so I was there on the day he got traded. It, it was cool because – I was playing about four out of six games a week, three to four games a week, and then he gets traded, and now I'm playing five to six games a week. So I was I was happy for Louie because it's a great opportunity for him. Um, we knew he was going to be in the big leagues as soon as possible, which ended up being this year. And I'm surprised at what he did just because, like, it's unheard of. It's like, you know, it happened so quick. But I didn't – I never thought he couldn't do it. Uh, he's very – he hits balls super hard. He's extremely fast. Like his game just plays really well um, at every level. And I hope he gets to enjoy the playoff experience. But he was fun to he was fun to play with. He's fun to watch. Uh, his English is getting better, but it wasn't very good back then. So not a ton of conversations as far as like real meaningful conversations. Just kind of like you yell out Louie or you know whatever, and they call me Topo all the Latin. So he would yell out Topo, and, and uh, that would kind of be our, our way of communicating. You know, Jax, you you obviously obviously been in the minors for a while, and uh, I, you, usually when you're in AAA, you're right there on the borderline of making it to the majors. Do you see yourself in the next year or year and a half where you're going to get that, that call up, where you're going to get the opportunity to step, uh, you know, step up to the plate and get your opportunity to to swing at top major league baseball pitchers? Uh, we'll see. You know, I'll, I'll be if I ever do get that chance, that opportunity, I'll for sure be ready for it. Um, but the Rangers got, a, they got a good team. So there's not a lot of room up there and I understand that, but if I ever get the chance, I'll, I'll, I'll be ready for it. So you also, you also look at the versatility. Now you play three different positions in triple a, and we've seen a lot of these combinations of guys playing first base and corner outfield or center field and shortstop. I, I, so I think some of the Royals have a couple of guys that could do that. And some of the other teams left in the playoffs. Like, do you think versatility is something that really matters in today's game when judging these prospects just to get the bats in the lineup? I think it does for, for that last point right there of getting certain guys in the lineup. So, you know, if you got a guy who's a really good shortstop, like, like Louie, um, well, Louie is not going to play over Lindor. It's just, you know, they're paying Lindor too much money for that to ever happen. And so, you know, Lindor gets hurt. And Louis goes up there, shows, shows his shoes for, you know, the time while he's hurt, ends up playing really well. It's like, okay, well, he can play second and third, plus plug him in at second. And just to give Louis, you know, it just adds more, more, uh, you know, more golf clubs to his bag. And, you know, the more clubs you got, the more shots you can take. So I think it's a huge deal. Um, but I think once you solidify yourself as, you know, a star in the show, you'll stick at one spot. But I think to get up there for guys who – aren't like a superstar potential like me or whoever has to play multiple spots and be good at playing those spots. Well, the Yankee uh, Volpe just robbed a, a base hit and uh, Witt is on first base and you know, his, his kind of speed, it's uh it's, um, that was an unbelievable catch. That was a nice play. Uh, yeah. That was a beautiful think, play. He read it. You're ahead of me. You're ahead of me by like seven seconds. Oh, you know, uh, you know, we're in New York, you know. <laughs> <laughs> an, hour, an hour and seven seconds. You're <laughs> Time zone differences, streaming. Yeah, same thing. Uh, it sounds about right. <laughs> are are y'all Yankee fans or Mets fans? Or I'm a Mets fan. He's I'm a, a Yankee, Yankee fan. I'm a Yankee fan. But, you know, I'm I'm a radio guy. So, you know, when hey, you're you went, 
You want to hear a cool Met fact? Met Go ahead, fact? Let's, hear let's hear it. So the Mets beat the Brewers in the playoffs this earlier this past week. Mm-hmm. Every team that beats the Brewers in the playoffs goes to the World Series. Ah, I like it. And it's, it's, now they're only one round away. So they're only one round away. And, and, you know, maybe it lasts longer. We'll see. Oh, well, you know what lasts longer? I'm not watching Perez come up to the court. <laughs> Okay, I, this guy kills the Yankees. 